tonight. Huge relief. The First Minister's family safely cross from Gaza to Egypt. They are among a number of British nationals allowed to pass through the Rafah border, but many others are still waiting. It was a special moment for me to be able to phone up my 14-year-old uh, while she was in her school break to tell her that Granny uh, and Grandpa are coming home. Also making the headlines, all strikes suspended. Next week's planned school closures have been halted as Unison ballots its members on a new pay offer. I'm in the fire service control room in Johnson, ahead of one of the busiest weekends of the year. And in sport, we look ahead to this weekend's League Cup semi-finals at Hampden. I'm Vanessa Kennedy in Edinburgh. And I'm John Mackay in Glasgow. This is the STV News at six. Good evening. The First Minister says he is hugely relieved his wife's parents have safely left Gaza. Elizabeth and Majid El Nakla from Dundee are among 92 British nationals allowed to pass through the Rafa border into Egypt. Hamza Youssef has described the last four weeks as a living nightmare for his relatives and has repeated calls for an immediate ceasefire. One family's relief comes as others still wait for news for their loved ones. Here's our chief reporter, Sharon Frew. The Rafa crossing offers the only way in and out of Gaza. On the list, with permission to leave, are the wounded, the sick and foreign nationals. The names this morning included the First Minister's wife's parents. Now in Egypt, preparations are being made to fly them back to Scotland. Hugely relieved, of course, and it was a special moment for me to be able to phone up my 14-year-old uh, while she was in her school break to tell her that Granny uh, and Grandpa are coming home. I did manage to speak to my mother-in-law. Um, to be honest, they're incredibly traumatised, as you'd imagine they would be, almost four weeks in a war zone. Where's humanity? Where's people's hearts in the world? Three weeks ago, the First Minister's mother-in-law released this video from inside Gaza. As the conflict escalated, Elizabeth El Nakla and her husband sheltered in a house with 100 others, struggling to access clean drinking water and surviving on rapidly diminishing supplies. My mother-in-law and father-in-law have left behind four grandchildren. They're leaving behind uh, their son, uh, my, my, my brother-in-law, who's a doctor in Al Nasser Hospital. Uh, their four grandchildren, the youngest is only three months old now. So really difficult for them to leave, uh, but of course, uh, when the opportunity was there, everybody was rightly telling them to, to take that opportunity to get back to safety. Another on the list, still waiting for confirmation that he can travel to the border, is Yola's husband. In Bailiston, she continues to wait for a message from Eunice, telling her he can cross into Egypt. Death is literally one neighbour away. They bombed his neighbours two days ago. They don't have electricity now. They don't have anything. So my, his phone might be down. He's going to charge his phone now in the hospital, in Nasser Hospital. I'm stressing about everything, about everything. Yola says she has to remain hopeful that her reunion with her husband is only days away. Sharon Frew, STV News. Planned school strikes across Scotland will now be suspended as the union Unison ballots its members on a fresh pay offer from the council body COSLA. School support workers were due to walk out in a number of local authorities on Wednesday. COSLA says more than £17 million of additional funding has been found to meet Unison's demands. Here's our political reporter, Laura Alderman. As pupils headed home for the weekend, parents here at Ball Green Primary School in Edinburgh were still worrying about potential strikes next week. Just thinking maybe today I'll mail my manager and see if I can get day off for that to stay with the kids. It's been very disruptive because I'm having to take the time off work. I'm having to find childcare if I can swap my shifts and stuff at work. The cost of living crisis is hitting everybody really hard so I can understand why they want more money to be able to support themselves and their families too. Pupils and parents across the country have faced their fair share of disruption in recent years from remote learning during the pandemic to this recent round of industrial action. Many are simply hoping for a return to normality. 
And now that could be a little closer. In the last few hours, Unison have suspended all planned strikes after COSLA announced an extra £17.2 million of funding to meet their demands. The new offer will increase the wages of the lowest paid by £2,000 a year and, crucially, be backdated to April for all staff. We feel that this is now an offer that we can put to our members with a recommendation to accept. Um, it's as far as we've been able to go, but the actions of Unison members over the last few months have added more than an additional £100 million to the local government pay bill and into the pockets of local government workers. Two other unions already accepted a revised pay offer while Unison held out for a better deal. No one from COSLA was available for interview today, but in a statement said it hoped this would end the dispute and get money into the pockets of its workforce as soon as possible. Laura Alderman, STV News, Edinburgh. Relatives of Scots who died from coronavirus have told STV News the revelations coming out of the public inquiry about how key decisions were made have been far worse than they expected. A number of special advisers and civil servants have been giving evidence this week about what was happening behind the scenes at the heart of government. Here's our senior reporter, Gordon Cree. Three women who'd lost loved ones to COVID have spent this week closely watching the public inquiry. The evidence has come from people who were in the room with Boris Johnson when key decisions were made, but the picture painted is of chaos, confusion and a culture of misogyny. It wasn't in any doubt in my mind at that point that we were heading for a total disaster. Did you treat individuals in Downing Street with offence and misogyny, Mr Cummings? Certainly not. What will probably be clear in COVID, it was the wrong crisis for this Prime Minister's skill set. Put a red light outside number 10 because it's a house of ill repute and they have charged us and they have charged us the ultimate cost of human lives. It really beggars belief at uh, the level of incompetence, misogyny and sheer arrogance as well. Boris Johnson's comment about let the older people die and face their fate and not trash the economy for people that are going to die anyway. Well, that was my mum uh, for one, that was my husband for another. Elaine's brother Robert died with the virus in February 2021. He was on the verge of returning home after three years of rehab for a stroke. To find out that they didn't even know if the rules were the right rules or not, and that they were laughing and joking and scrambling to find a solution is absolutely soul destroying. Jane's wife, Jackie, died from COVID in October 2020. She says for many of the bereaved, the current hearings are a difficult watch. Although you're seeing that they're trying to get to the bottom of it, which is good, and we do need that, it also is opening raw wounds again, and people are really struggling with their grief because of everything that's coming out. Of course it brings things back, and there are moments when I think about my mum, moments when I think about my husband, and all of the things that went around um, there, going into hospital um, and their death. I'm, I'm looking for justice and truth and accountability. Gordon Cree reporting there. Now, with the 5th of November fast approaching, many will be looking forward to a weekend of fireworks, sparklers and bonfires. But for the emergency services, this is one of their most challenging times of the year. Already this week, fire crews have reported being attacked while responding to call-outs. The service is urging against antisocial behaviour and asking the public to only attend official events. In a moment, we'll cross to Caroline Lewis, who's at a fireworks display in air. But first, Vanessa Taff is in Johnson's Fire and Rescue Control Room. 
Well, the skies will be alight this weekend and so will the phones in this control room. As you can see behind me, there's a map of the large area of the west that this team cover and they're getting prepared for an exceptionally busy weekend. Now, in June, the Scottish Government introduced the ability for councils to implement what they're calling firework exclusion zones, which means that anybody who sets off fireworks in these zones without permission could face criminal charges or a fine. But so far, though, none of the council areas have got that legislation in place in enough time for Bonfire Weekend. Well, Jackie joins me now and you're the area commander. Jackie, how much of a difference would those zones potentially make to your team on what is one of your busiest weekends? Any legislation will help um, that helps support uh, reduce the number of calls that we may, re may receive into the control room um, is very welcome. So in the run up to Bonfire Night, we see an increase in the number of calls that we receive. Our highly professional control staff are here ready to take calls um, from members of the public. Uh, they're able to remain calm in a pressurised situation. Um, we see on Bonfire Night itself around 1,000 calls taken across our three control rooms here in Johnson, Dundee and Edinburgh. So what can people at home do or people who are going out do to help you guys this weekend? Well, firstly, we would ask people to um, attend an organised display if they can, um, and they can find a list of them on our, our website. Um, but if you are going to have something at home or in the community, we would ask that you follow all the safety guidance and make sure that you stay safe. By that way, um, by staying safe, then you won't have to call for our support, and that will help reduce the number of calls. Jackie, thank you. An exceptionally busy weekend ahead for the team here and at the fire control rooms across the country. Well, Caroline Lewis is at one of those displays for us tonight. Well, this is one of the first events to kick off Bonfire Weekend. It's a little quiet at the moment, but not for long, as this is sold out and they're expecting around 4,000 people on a lovely night like this. But these things just ha don't happen overnight. So I'm joined by Graham Ferguson from Air Rugby Club. Graham, how much work goes into organising something like this so it's safe and fun for everyone? Uh, huge amount, as you can imagine. A lot of volunteers behind the scenes, a lot of agencies get involved, police, road traffic, ambulance, council, um, a huge amount of effort. What kind of safety measures have you got in place for tonight? So it's fully ticketed. Um, we've sold out for the first time ever. It's all electronic on an app, so there's no people just appearing. We know exactly how many people are here, and uh, we want to make it a safe environment for everyone to come and enjoy the, the whole experience. Why is it you know, beneficial for families to come to something like this instead of trying to do their own one? So we're a community club. Um, we deliver rugby across the county um, and we want families to be at Air Rugby Club and enjoy the whole facilities. And this is a part of everything we do throughout the year. Graham, that's brilliant. Well, before the crowds get too big, I'm going to go see if I can find myself some candy floss or maybe a toffee apple. Caroline Lewis having a good night in air. A global shortage of ADHD medication is sparking fears among parents that young people with the condition will face impossible challenges before stocks are expected to renew in December. The shortage is so severe some NHS staff have been instructed not to prescribe the drug to newly diagnosed patients. Caitlin Hutchinson has more. As drug supply runs low, it's a worrying time for families with experience of ADHD. Joy and her two children are all counting the last of their prescriptions. A couple of teenagers at home is a struggle for anybody, but unmedicated ADHD teenagers, it'll just be <laughs> like a war zone in here. Joy was diagnosed herself later on in life and says the medication has been transformational, but her focus is her kids and she's worried about problems with attention span, restlessness and impulsivity making a hasty return. My son, he'd always got reports from school saying, you know, he's capable, but he just doesn't. He, they always used to say he makes poor choices. And uh, I just thought that I wasn't a good mum. My daughter's got about four four days left or something. I'm very worried about that because, um, you know, she's getting close to doing her exams. Of all the times of her life, she needs to be able to focus. Abruptly stopping some medicines like guanfacine can be dangerous too, as it can result in a sudden high blood pressure. 
ADHD experts have warned that if pharmacy stocks run out, as many already have, it could be life-changing for the young people that involves. The some 26,000 patients prescribed with ADHD medication in the last year are being advised to shop around if that happens and to restrict drug use until things improve. Perhaps we should have seen this coming because over the last decade, the number of diagnoses of ADHD has multiplied seven times, which is massive. It's really important for teachers, lecturers, supervisors, and also employers to be aware people might be having to do with less medication or even have run out. It's hoped the shortages will be resolved by the new year, which won't be a moment too soon for Joy and her family. Caitlin Hutchison, STV News. More stories from the West and a man has been arrested in connection with the death of another man in Glasgow. Police were called to Kirkton Avenue area of Knightswood just after 9 o'clock last night. A 33-year-old man was found dead at the scene. Inquiries are ongoing. Seven teenagers have been charged in connection with the attempted murder of a 15-year-old boy in a Glasgow park. The attack happened in Lynn Park on October the 21st. Seven boys aged between 13 and 15 have been charged and will appear at Glasgow Sheriff Court later this month. Engineers working at First Bus Glasgow are to walk out for two days. Around 150 workers are to take action on the 16th and 17th of November after rejecting a recent pay offer. More than a thousand bus drivers are also in a separate pay dispute with the company. First Bus says the offer would see a 13% pay rise and it will look to reopen talks. The first successful test flight has taken place of a drone which will carry essential medicines, blood and organs throughout Scotland. As part of the trials, the drone flew from the Golden Jubilee Hospital to Glasgow Airport. The project is running in partnership with the NHS and is being viewed as an important step towards integrating drones into modern airspaces. A new £5 million artificial intelligence project has been trialled to help predict how major storms will impact Scotland's energy network. Predict for Resilience can make predictions seven days in advance, meaning engineers and equipment can be moved into place before the fault occurs, as Ollie Dickinson explains. With high winds, torrential rain and heavy flooding, storms like Babette and Kieran are becoming more and more common. They often cause power cuts and in remote areas can leave customers in the dark for long periods of time. But could artificial intelligence hold the answer? This project at Scottish Power's base in Rutherglen is finding out. It doesn't happen often that we have people off supply, but we do have people off, so it's very important we react as quickly as possible. This technology allows us to make sure that we've got people in place across the central belt of Scotland in the right place to react quickly to get people back on. Data from previous storms, maps, the energy network and more are all analysed in this room. The team can then predict when and where a fault might occur, as well as what type of problem it will be. It means they can send the right kit from their depot to the right job. So the AI tells us where the issues are, we can work out what voltage that is again, because that, if we need to bolster up with contractors, we have contractors who work at different um, voltages, so we can also ring them and say, can you come and give us a hand? Um, and we can take out the right insulators, the right spacers, things like that that would matter um, in time saving for getting customers back in service. The technology could go further though, the more it learns and models, the more accurate it gets. Soon it's hoped it will predict faults before they happen. We have many data sets to feed in already. That gives us a good start in terms of uh, being able to predict the impacts of a storm as it rolls in. But you're absolutely right. Over the course of time, more data, more learning, uh, more accuracy. As we all learn to live with the challenges of a changing climate, this technology could provide a degree of certainty in ever-changing conditions. Ollie Dickinson, STV News. Uh, after a full midweek of football action, we're into a weekend of football action. <laughs> and much more besides, Ronald. Can't get enough football, John. <laughs> Good evening to you all. James Tavernier says he's determined to end Rangers' 12-year wait to win the League Cup, but admits they'll need to be at their best to defeat Hearts in Sunday's semi-final. Stephen Naismith believes his team are good enough to go on and win silverware this season. Meanwhile, Hibs boss Nick Montgomery is urging his players to add to the club's previous cup successes. They take on Aberdeen in their last four tie. Here's Jamie Borthwick. 
It's the domestic trophy that so far eluded him. James Tavernier says it's time to finally etch Rangers' name back on the League Cup. It's obviously a weight that we have to you know, get rid of um, as soon as possible. It's uh, obviously a cup that's um, you know, something I've never had my hands on. And yeah, it's something that the boys will obviously uh, try to do the best, but we've obviously got to get past uh, Hearts first. Philippe Clément expects his side to continue an upward trajectory regardless of the occasion. If I think, oh, now, now they're motivated because it's semi-final and we can win a cup, it's totally the, the wrong message. They need to be motivated every day, every game, to show the best of themselves. Hearts have been to Hamden eight times in the last five seasons and lost three cup finals. Now Stephen Naismith wants an end to the team's hard luck stories. You need to go through the hard times to, to recognise, how one, how close you are and, and what an opportunity it is. The next level is that you do win a trophy. Um, I believe we're good enough um, and we've got a good opportunity on Sunday to, to take the next step. I think you can you can easily get caught up in everything that goes on around the game. Um, but we just need to concentrate on the task at hand and that for us is, is beating Rangers in a 90 minute game of football if it goes further on that. Memories of the 2007 League Cup win and 2016's famous Scottish Cup triumph hang on the walls around Hibernian's training base. No shortage of motivation for the players ahead of tomorrow's semi-final. Now is an opportunity for some of the players that have been there before um, to, to, to try and get to that moment again and players that have never been there before to try and get to that moment. So you know, any time to get to a cup final is is something that you can look back on in your career. But right now it's you know it's 90 minutes plus extra time, whatever it is, and, and, and we'll give everything we've we've got to, to try and make sure we can get to the final. See that feeling you get when you win something and you're with all your teammates and you do it and it's a feeling you'll never replace again, ever. That for the players is it's there for them, you know. If you want that, if you want to have that, that's the that's the most important thing when you retire. Jamie Borthwick, STV News. News from Celtic now, and Brendan Rodgers says his team aren't good enough at scoring penalties, but believes this will improve. Celtic have missed two spot kicks in their last three league games. Meanwhile, as the club prepare for a busy fixture schedule, the Parkhead boss is confident his players have the quality and mentality to cope. Here's Ronnie Charters. On Wednesday night, it was David Turnbull and O who made the difference against St Mirren. Two players who aren't regular starters, given their chance by Brendan Rodgers. Now, as Celtic begin a run of 14 games before the winter break, the manager's praising the strength of his squad. And I think it's testament to their professionalism. I've always said that you can't come in like Dave Turnbull the other night and, and play to the level and, the, and score the goal he did if you're not focused in training and, and working very hard. So the, the intensity that the players produce every single day is, is first class. So that allows them to be ready when they do come in. And, uh, and, and all the guys that come in in the mid week made a really important contribution for us. Despite his goal, Turnbull also missed a penalty in the 2-1 win at Celtic Park. It's the second time in less than two weeks the champions have failed to convert from the spot. We're not good enough with penalties. I've made that clear. So uh, when, I, when I look across over a period of time here, especially with the players that are that are gifted, you know, a lot of technically gifted players here. So um, so it's something that we will improve on. It's a it's a skill that you can be better at, but you have to practice and practice and practice and get your routine and and. Uh, yeah, and it's something that uh, that we do on a daily basis. So um, I can't deny we it's an area we have to be better in. The Premiership action continues for Celtic this weekend as they head north to face Ross County tomorrow. Ronnie Charters, STV News. Kamalik manager Derek McInnes says he may need to go more defensive to get better results away from home. Kelly, who are away to Motherwell tomorrow, have taken two points from 15 on the road this season. We've had five away games now in the league this season. Um, we've picked up a draw at Tyne Castle, a draw at Dens when we should have won. Uh, we lost late on against Motherwell. We've lost to St Johnson, we lost at Celtic. So three defeats and two draws. Um, doesn't matter our home form, of course it doesn't. So we need to look at. I need to look at things differently as well. Potentially, maybe we do need to go a wee bit more defensive. 
And there's one other game in the Premiership this weekend. On Sunday, David Martindale's Livingston side are away to Dundee. OK, let's give you some rugby news. And Scotland internationals Duhan van der Merwe and Pierre Schumann will make their first appearance for Edinburgh this season when they face Leinster tomorrow. Sean Everett's side have won their opening two matches of the United Rugby Championship campaign. The players know they face a stiff test in Dublin. Obviously one of the you know the giants of the club game, but that's great for us. Like we want to test ourselves against the best. And we know RDS isn't going to be an easy place to go, but hopefully the like clarity we've got on ourselves and the way we've been playing, hopefully we're gonna to manage to impose our game on them. It's obviously great getting two wins to start the season. You can't really complain about that. Sean coming in, it's great how he's kind of imposed how he wants us to play the game. And I think the preseason we've had, we've come off the back of that quite strong. And at Scotson tonight, Glasgow Warriors are at home to Stormers. That, folks, is all your sport from me tonight. Have a great weekend. I'll see you again on Monday. OK, thanks, Raman. Right time for the weather now. Let's see what it has in store ahead of Bonfire Weekend here, Sean. A breezy morning will be followed up with a flurry of fresh delights for lunch. TUI sponsors STV Weather. A very good evening to you. Well, it really is all go storm wise at the moment. Very active jet stream across the Atlantic. Storm Kieran yesterday, Storm Domingos over the next couple of days, named by the Spanish Met Service because it's going to mainly affect them and also France and brush the south of England once again. So the storm track staying well to the south. Good news for us because it means here, further away from all of that activity, the weather is much quieter. There will be a few showers around at the weekend, but a lot of dry and quiet weather. And that should be the case through tonight. One or two scattered showers still across the Hebrides, but for most of was dry, clear spells, and we could get some mist and fog patches developing with really still air through the night as well. Temperatures down to about five or six degrees. So quite a cool night, a misty start to the day for quite a few of us, and it could be quite slow to clear away, which will peg the temperatures back somewhat at around seven or eight degrees in the afternoon. So quite a, a cool afternoon, but it should be a crisp autumn day for many of us. Uh, top temperatures probably peaking out about 10 degrees in western parts, 50 degrees in Fahrenheit. So tomorrow, not a bad day at all, apart from a few very isolated showers cropping up. On Sunday, expect though here in the west, we'll start to see a few more showers developing, especially across the Highlands, Argyll and Butte. One or two also coming into Ayrshire a little bit later on, but a lot of dry and bright weather elsewhere. The storm track at the moment well to the south of us. However, it looks as if that will drift its way northwards in the next couple of weeks, which does mean the storms come home and we'll see wetter conditions. Bye-bye. TUI sponsors STV Weather. And finally, the Scottish Music Awards will take place tomorrow night with everyone from The Who to singer-songwriter Callum Beatty set to be recognised. 25 years since the awards began, Laura Boyd went to the Barrowlands to meet some of the acts being honoured this year and to find out what the accolade means to them. On Saturday night, the Scottish Music Awards will take place and Woody of the Bay City Rollers is amongst those being recognised, picking up the Legend Award. Born and bred, Edinburgh, uh, Scottish through and through, and to be you know, that kind of award, that's truly amazing. November 1973, I got asked if I wanted to join the Bay City Rollers. 50 years, hard to believe, and we're loving doing the songs more now than what we were doing back then. Also performing and picking up awards on the night are rapper Bems and singer Katie Gregson McLeod. It feels especially validating I think to be like recognised as part of the Scottish the Scottish community. I think that um just being part of that and kind of like having my little place in it feels just really nice. The music scene in, in Scotland is it's so vibrant and and amazing at the higher level and at grassroots as well. So having these awards is, is very, very important. The awards will take place in the Barrowlands and organiser Donald McLeod can't think of a more fitting place to host them. The Barrowlands is Scottish. Scotland's a music venue, it's iconic. You feel it, you walk in and you just, you know it's right. Come Saturday night, this room will be packed with people celebrating the good and great of Scottish music. But these awards are much more than just that, as over the years they have raised hundreds of thousands of pounds for the Nordoff and Robbins Music Therapy Charity. 
as someone who's a big advocate for like mental health and, and well-being as well, to have such an event to raise money for such an organisation, it means it means it means the world, you know. A special cause on a special night. Laura Boyd, STV News. Oh, some great music to look forward to then this weekend. Plenty to look forward to this weekend as well with all the sport that Raman brought us to from all of us here. Enjoy <laughs> it. Thank you for watching. Good night. Good night.